Amen. Thank you, Mike. Something about the church in unison proclaiming their identity. I love it. You know, I am convinced that cars are responsible for car accidents. I mean, you think about it. Every time you see a car accident, what's involved? Cars. Now, some would suggest that maybe it's not the cars, that it's actually the driver of the cars. And maybe that's true, but I still maintain that every time you see a car wreck, there's always cars involved. Is my theory silly and flawed? Yeah, but no more silly and flawed than someone who says the love of money is the root of all evil. Because that's not what that scripture says, is it? No, that oft-recited verse that is misquoted actually says this. Paul writes, For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The phrase that is often excluded that changes the entire tenor and tone of that passage is the phrase, for a love of money, right? That's key, because money in and of itself is neutral. There's nothing evil about money. It's not the money in hand, it's the motive of the heart that's the problem, right? Because money is just paper, it's just coin, it's just plastic. Nothing is inherently evil about money but rather it's man's relationship to money that's the problem. Notice that Paul also says, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. He doesn't even say it's the root of every form of evil. He just says it's a root. Because there's a lot of roots of evil, and money is just one of them that plays into it, right? Selfishness, injustice, pornography, prostitution, envy, jealousy, greed, blackmail, Uh, All these things are related to a love of money. It's the root of all these different sins, right? I mean, you'd be hard-pressed to find a sin that wasn't rooted in greed or a love of money. I mean, you just go back to the Ten Commandments, for instance. Think about the Ten Commandments and think about how all of them are related to that phrase, thou shalt not covet. Commandment one. You shall have no other gods before me. Well, I mean, we've already established that that money is an easy God for people. Commandment two, you shall not make for yourself an idol. Well, this happens all the time, doesn't it? In our culture, people bow down to the almighty dollar frequently, constantly. Commandment three, you shall not take the name of your Lord God in vain. I've heard a lot of people let the expletives fly when they lose money, haven't you? Commandment four, Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. You think about how many people can't even set aside one day for the Lord because they're too busy pursuing money and wealth. Commandment five, honor your father and your mother. You know, sadly, I have seen a lot of funerals where the kids are at odds with one another because their mother or their father died and they can't wait for the funeral service to be over so they can get to dividing up the estate. Commandment six, you shall not murder. How many crimes have been committed over greed and a love of money. Commandment seven, you shall not commit adultery. You know, despite what many people think, it's not always love that's the motivation behind an affair. Sometimes it's a love for money, a lust for money. Commandment eight, you shall not steal. Well, that one's self-explanatory, isn't it? Robbery, fraud, those kind of things are related to a love for money. Commandment nine says, you shall not bear false witness. How many people have lied in order to make more money or to get more money? We could go on, but I think you understand that all of the sins, it seems like, that can be committed are related to somehow greed or covetousness or a love for money. But here's the thing. I think all too often when the preacher preaches on money, he almost gives the impression that you should feel guilty if you have some. I think all too often when there's a sermon on money, the people are guilted into feeling bad because they have money. And the message seems to revolve around the fact that if you would just sell off everything you own, give it to the poor and go live in a monastery somewhere, you'd be much better off and you'd be more godly. But God doesn't condemn rich people. He doesn't say that being rich is a sin. The Bible does talk about the injustice 
that is done to people in order to get rich and how that's a sin, making money off the backs of poor people. The Bible does address that, but as far as just having money, that's not a sin. In fact, there are many righteous people in the Bible that were also wealthy. Job, Abraham, Joseph, David, Solomon. We could go on and on. So being rich is not the problem. Having money is not the issue. It's your relationship to your money that's the issue. So I think before we go any further, we need to get some things straight. And, and none of these things are earth-shattering revelations. But I think they're things that lay a foundation for what we're going to build on and get to. What you see here in our passage that we're studying this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 6 is you see Paul addressing three different groups of people. And what he's doing is he's giving a command, a reminder, and a warning. And the first is a command. And it's to the rich. And to the rich people, he says this, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. That first phrase implies something, doesn't it? Instruct those who are rich. I mean, right from the beginning, Paul tells us that there are some people who have more money than others. Just a fact. There are rich people and there are poor people. I mean, that's just the way it is. But Paul gives an instruction here, a command to the rich people. And what he tells the rich people is, you are not better than anyone else. Use your wealth wisely. You have no right to look down your nose at anyone, especially because of your finances. Having more money does not make you better than anybody else. Nothing gives a person the right to look down on others, especially when it comes to their wealth. Paul says, don't hoard your money. You've been blessed. Use that blessing to bless others. Use your money to further the kingdom, right? And then Paul addresses a second group here. He addresses those who are rich, and then he addresses those who are not rich. And here's what he says to them. This is a reminder to those who are not rich. He says, And constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. And so what Paul is saying here is don't use religion or don't think religion is a way to get rich there are people who thought that in Paul's day and there are people who think that today right that religion is a means in which I can get rich of course this is what we commonly call the prosperity gospel or health and wealth theology whatever you want to call it it's completely unbiblical right absolutely unscriptural because the gospel should be able to be preached to anyone in any place at any time. And you cannot preach this gospel in Haiti. You cannot preach it in Liberia. You cannot go to the poor folks of Somalia and say, the only reason you're poor is because you don't have enough faith. And God wants to bless you, but he won't until you have enough faith. That is ridiculous. And of course, the people that are getting rich off the prosperity gospel are the false teachers, right? That's the only people that are really getting rich. And so what is being said here is, a reminder to those who, who are not rich that, look, the way to get rich is not through religion. That's not the way this happens. And so here's something else that Paul says. He says, find contentment in the giver, not the gift. It's not about money. It's about finding contentment in the source. Don't listen to those fools who commercialize religion. They are out for a profit. You want to be rich? Here's, here's how you get rich. He says, seek satisfaction in God. In Philippians 4 and 11, he says, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I love that phrase, I have learned to be content. That gives me courage because Paul had to learn it. And if Paul had to learn it, then I've got to learn it too, right? And that's good because I'm still learning. I'm still learning to be content. We all know that we can't take our possessions with us. We all know that riches aren't eternal. We understand that, uh, you know, there's no hearses pulling U-Hauls. We know all that. But 
knowing and doing are two different things a lot of times. We struggle with the application. Paul says, I have learned, and we need to learn that as well. You want true contentment in life? Then purchase something that will last beyond this life. Pursue the Lord and not riches. You see, unlike greed, contentment doesn't come by adding something to your life. Contentment comes by subtracting from what you desire. And so that brings us to the third group that Paul is addressing. Paul is speaking to the people who want to get rich, and he casts a warning. Verses 9 and 10, he says, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul warns those who want to get rich by telling them that such a pursuit is only going to end in ruin. It's an empty and hollow pursuit. You're purchasing pain. It's easy for us to become fulfilled with things that we believe we need, right? It's easy for us to take a want and turn that into a necessity. It's a good feeling when we get a little bit of money and we can afford some things that we've never been able to afford before. And soon, we can't live without those things, right? We begin to trust in the things that cannot fulfill. Greed promises, but ultimately, it doesn't deliver. It's hollow. It's empty. Notice verse 9 of 1 Timothy 6 again. He says, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. That word plunge there is the same Greek word that's used in Luke 5, 7 when the, the nets of fish were brought on board the boat and it almost sank it. It almost plunged it into the sea. That's what greed does. That's what a lust for money does. It causes us to sink. We may be going along fine, the seas may be smooth, but eventually we're going to sink if that, is our, if that is our purpose or pursuit. If that's what we're rowing the boat for, it's eventually going to sink and destruction is going to come. I mean, what's going to save you? Your money? Not a chance. Verse 10 speaks of this lust for more and how it can cause one to wander away from the faith. And the picture here is someone who is lost. No one really sets out to get lost. We think we're going on the right path. We think we're traveling down the right road only to learn at some point that we're not. Maybe we take a shortcut believing that that will get us there quicker only to realize that we're traveling in the wrong direction. No one purposely seeks to get lost. We find ourselves in that state because we've wandered away from the true north, the true compass, the way that it's pointing us. So Paul's warning here is greed is a black hole. Don't get sucked in. Don't wander away from the source of all blessings to follow the other blessings. Trust in the source. You know, men who trap animals in Africa to sell to American zoos have said that one of the most difficult animals to capture is the ring-tailed monkey. They said this agile animal is very difficult to catch There's one continent where the Zulu tribe lives that that has made a living out of trapping this animal. They don't have any difficulty nabbing it. You see, there's this melon that these ring-tailed monkeys are after. And it's not really the melon itself, it's the seeds that are inside of it. And so the Zulu tribe will cut a circle, a hole, into the melon. So that when the monkey reaches in to grab those seeds, that hole is only big enough for their little arm to fit through. Once they grab the seeds and clench onto it, they can't pull their hand out. They could if they dropped the seeds, but they won't do it. So all this talk about how smart monkeys are, they're not real smart when it comes to this, because if they had just dropped the seeds, they could pull their hand out, but they don't. They clench it, and then the Zulus sneak up behind them and nab them. And I think that describes us a lot of times. We're clinchers by nature, and we clinch whatever it is, whether it's our money or the things that money can buy, and we hold on to it tightly, and we're trapped, and and we won't drop it, and we won't let loose of it so that we can pull ourselves out. And so in the meantime, Satan sneaks up behind us, and he nabs us. Paul says, quit looking to money and the things that money can provide. Look to God. 
the only one who can provide the necessities of life. Again, take special note of verse 7. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. Folks, you can't keep what you gain anyway. You can't take it with you when you go. I've heard people say, oh, so-and-so, he was, he was very wealthy. He died a millionaire. No, he didn't. Nobody dies a millionaire. You die with nothing, right? Because you can't take it with you. Whatever you gain in this life, even if you're a trillionaire, it stays here so that others get to divide it up or keep it. But you don't die a millionaire. You die penniless. You die with only your soul. Money is a great servant, but it's a terrible master. And the sooner we realize that, the better. When my kids were really small, we were living in Missouri. My wife was driving back and forth to the University of Arkansas, which meant that sometimes I had to play Mr. Mom, a role that I was not real good at, but one that I learned to appreciate. And one of my responsibilities was on Monday mornings, I would take my kids to the library for story time. And after story time, all the mothers and me would take the kids to lunch. Cassville's not a big town, but the big hot spot to eat was McDonald's. It had a big indoor play area. The kids loved it. To them, it was the greatest thing ever. So we go to McDonald's. I get them all chicken nuggets and french fries, and we sit down. I got me some food, and we sat there, and we ate. And as they were eating, hurrying up so that they could go play, I would finish my food, and I'd, I'd grab a fry off one of them's tray. I'd grab a fry from the other one's tray. They weren't going to eat all their food. They never ate all their food. So I would help them out a little bit until eventually I grabbed a fry and one of them said, Dad, stop, that's my fry. And I thought, how are you saying that? I bought those fries. I brought you to McDonald's in my car. I bought this whole meal for you. You've heard of Lord of the Flies? I was Lord of the Fries, right? I bought these for you. I purchased them. I could go up to the counter and order, you know, six more orders of fries and eat them all by myself. You know, ultimately, I would love for my kids to say, Daddy, you want more fries? You know, and offer them. But instead, they hoarded them. They were greedy. And they weren't even their fries to begin with. Same with us. These are not our fries. These these things that we have in our possession are not really our possessions. They don't belong to us. And we can't take them with us when we go. Paul makes something very clear that we all have to understand, and that is God owns everything. Do you possess certain things, or do your possessions possess you? That's the question. Now, that's hard for us because we tend to think, well, I worked hard for this, and because I worked hard for it, then it's mine, and I can spend it the way I want to. I can do with it what I want. But even your ability to work was given to you by God. Even your ability to do anything was, is a gift from God. How are you going to use it? Are you going to use it to honor him or to dishonor him, right? I humbly recognize that God has given me the ability to preach the word of God. And I can honor God with that ability or I can dishonor him. I can preach untruth. I can contort the scriptures and distort scriptures in order to fit my agenda. Or I can preach the truth in love. I can present the word of God as if he is speaking through me to help others grow in their faith and to make and grow disciples, right? I can use this ability that he has given me to get you to give me more money, like the prosperity preachers, or I can present the scriptures to help you to further your faith and to mature and grow. And we all have that opportunity. Any ability that you have been given Any talent that you have been blessed with is not to be misused and abused. It's not to be treated selfishly. It's not just money that we're talking about. It's your spouse. It's your children. It's your job. It's your time. All these things are a blessing from God that you either use to honor him through good stewardship or dishonor him by treating it selfishly. Look at verses 11 through 16. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 
I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Paul is speaking of wealth. He's talking about riches, of course. He's giving instructions about how we are to have a prosperous life, and it comes down to investing in things that are eternal, like righteousness and godliness and holiness and faith and love. Don't purchase the things that are only going to bring you pain in the end. Paul says, buy what you cannot lose. And it's interesting that that phrase, love for money here, found in verse 10, it's a phrase, and I'm sure I'll butcher it, philaguros. It's funny when we're in Bible class, and Bible class teachers will pronounce a Greek word, and they'll ask me, Chris, is that right? I don't know. I'm not a Greek scholar by any means, but philaguros is a Greek word, and you might notice that the, the beginning, the prefix of that word is phila. Or phileo, which is a form of love in the Greek, more specifically, brotherly affection or brotherly love. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. And so what Paul is saying here is by using that word for love of money, philaguros, he's saying you should not love money the same way you're supposed to love the brethren. Remember, Paul is talking to the church here, right? He's speaking to Christians and he's telling them you cannot love money the same way you love your fellow man. It doesn't work that way. You cannot have brotherly affection for your money. If a man loves money in the same way that he should love his brethren, then it's easy to see why he's going to wander from the faith and pierce himself with many griefs. So Paul's instruction to the church is, you cannot love money more than you love the brethren. You cannot love money more than you love the lost. We're going to be in heaven with the brethren, not money. So get your priorities straight, right? Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Paul tells us right here what truly matters. Here's what truly matters, to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, to store up the treasure of a good foundation for the future. That's what really matters. Making regular deposits in the First National Bank of Heaven, right? That's what matters. Storing up treasures that are eternal, not treasures that are temporary. And do you know why all of this matters? Any idea why all of this truly matters? Because all of these things are going to reap eternal dividends. You have something to show for these things. But earthly wealth you have nothing to show for when you're gone. The only thing that should have true value to you in the end is your soul because that's the only thing you're taking with you. So take care of it above all else, right? A love of money only purchases pain. That's the message that Paul is trying to get across. I was reading a story on the internet the other day. It was on the internet so it has to be true, right? And it was about archaeologists unearthing some ruins in Pompeii, the ruins of Pompeii. Remember, that was, the, that was the ancient city that was destroyed by that massive volcanic eruption. Was it Mount Vesuvius? I think it was. And so they're unearthing this archaeological digs. They're, they're finding people that were actually kind of frozen in time, if you will. And, and they found one person. It was a woman who was found running at the time she died they found her lying in the earth running but as she's running she's reaching back for something and as they dig a little further they find a bag of pearls so she was running out of the city gates when the volcanic eruption hit and what was slowing her down more than likely she may have died anyway but what was slowing her down was this reaching back for a bag of pearls and I thought about that, and I thought, wow, God's got great timing because I'm reading this article as we're about to do this sermon, and I think, isn't, isn't that a good description of many of us, many people in our world? Is it, you know, we're always reaching back for something. 
instead of just running full on toward heaven, it seems like something's always garnering our attention and causing us to reach back. And you know what? More times than not, the thing that's causing us to reach back, the thing that we're reaching back for, is something we can't take with us anyway. Something that has absolutely no value in heaven to begin with. You know, my grandfather was one of the most prominent, well, was the most prominent person in my life, my hero, a superhero. I wish you could have met him, a wonderful, wonderful man. And I was by his side as he was dying. And just before he took his last breath, he was reaching. I don't know what he was reaching for. His eyes were closed and he just did this. Now, it it could have been the drugs that he was on. It could have been a lot of things. He could have been hallucinating. I don't know what it was. You know what I'd like to think it was? I'd like to think it was heaven. I'd like to think that's what he was reaching for. I'd like to think it was the hand of God, right? I'd like to think that it was him reaching out for our Lord because his time on earth was about to be over and he was ready to go. That's what I'd like to believe. But truth of the matter is we should all be reaching. Every single one of us. And here's the deal. Not reaching back. Reaching forward. Reaching for heaven. Mike's going to lead us in a song. If you haven't been reaching for heaven, if you veered off course and you're lost, maybe you've never gotten on course and maybe you're ready to to walk the life of a disciple and we want to help you with that. If something is causing you to reach back, let us pray for you. If you have a need this morning that we can help you with, don't leave here without being right with God. Come as we stand and as we sing.